Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the first session of our series on promoting independence and access through responsible design. Our session today will be presented by Melissa Anderson. Melissa is a professional engineer specializing in pedestrian safety and access for people with disabilities. She was the transportation engineer for the U.S. Access Board and worked to develop the most recent version of the proposed Public Rights of Way Accessibility Guidelines. Melissa currently owns her own company, providing pedestrian accessibility training across the country and assisting state and local agencies in assessing and writing policies and updating transition plans. She also serves as a third-party consultant when clients find themselves facing compliance reviews or other enforcement actions. So uh, we are very excited about our session today. And without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Melissa. One of the four-part series, and we're going to talk about the laws and obligations. Here's slide 15. And then we're just going to talk about pedestrian access route basics. Our next webinar will include safe and accessible intersections, and that will be curb ramps, um, traffic signals, and street crossings. Third part will be curbside access, so all the things you find off of the curb, um, bus stops, parking, passenger loading zones. And then our fourth part, we'll be talking about how to make this actually work on your projects. Getting things to be accessible in the public right-of-way, I know, is really tough. So we're going to dig into some of the how-tos at the end. Slide 16. So today we're going to be talking about the obligations and the laws, and then the technical requirements for pedestrian access routes. So we'll talk about the laws. Then we'll go into standards and guidelines, what your Title II obligations are, and the technical requirements for pedestrian access routes. Slide 17. So accessibility is a civil right. And there are actually three federal civil rights laws. I left out the Architectural Barriers Act, but it was, it was um, signed by Congress in 1968 and applied to federal facilities. But the ones that we're most concerned about are 1973 Rehabilitation Act, Section 504, which applies to programs and activities that receive federal funds. And then in 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed into law by Congress. And it, just, it prohibits discrimination in the provision of facility services and programs. And the Americans with Disabilities Act has several different titles or chapters. Title II applies to state and local governments. And that's primarily what we'll be talking about today. Um, slide 18. So how do we know how to make something accessible? In 1973, with the Rehabilitation Act, Congress established the US Access Board. The Access Board is an independent federal agency made up of representatives from the major um, agencies in the federal government, the Department of Defense, Department of Education, uh, Transportation, Department of Justice, uh, and several others. And it also has public members. And they work together to help establish the minimum design criteria for accessibility. And they're responsible for minimum criteria for telecommunications, like your cell phones and websites, medical diagnostic equipment, which is something that, that came up fairly recently, the built environment, which is buildings, sites, and recreation areas, and also transportation. And transportation includes the infrastructure, and it also includes vehicles, like buses and trains. So they're required to develop guidelines that establish the minimum level of access. And then other enforcing agencies have to adopt those guidelines. And then they can be enforced. So when the Access Board sets minimum standards, 
another agency can go above and beyond, typically they will change the scoping if they make any changes at all. Uh, Department of Justice took the 2004 uh, architectural barriers, uh, architectural barriers, Americans with Disabilities Act accessibility guidelines, written by the Access Board, and they sent it out for public comment um, and determined that, for instance, prison cells needed to be more accessible than what the Access Board has determined. So the technical requirements stayed the same, but instead of two percent being required to be accessible, three percent were accessible. And the Department of Transportation, likewise, they took those same guidelines in 2004 and developed their 2006 Department of Transportation ADA standards, and they added to the scoping that curb ramps had to have detectable warnings. And both of these standards primarily apply to buildings and sites. So they don't specifically apply to the public right-of-way. And there are other enforcing agencies, so the Department of Defense, Department of Education, General Services, they all enforce standards that's been adopted from the minimum design criteria. Slide 19. So when we look at enforcement for the public right-of-way, um, the agencies responsible for that are the Department of Transportation, and they were given that authority under Section 504 in the Rehabilitation Act. And enforcement through the Department of Transportation is complaint-based. The Department of Justice also enforces access in the public right-of-way. And they have authority because they have to ensure that state and local agencies provide accessible programs and services and activities. Their enforcement typically is complaint-based, but they also have a program called Project Civic Access. And Project Civic Access is, I call them DOJ's SWAT team. They will come down on your community and they will do an evaluation of just a few elements and they will take those as an example of probably what the rest of your community looks like. And then they will help you decide how you're going to meet the requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And you end up with a settlement agreement that generally requires you to do a self-evaluation and make improvements. So complaints for um, civil rights violations are very easy to file. You can file one with the Department of Justice website. And they obviously can't investigate every single complaint, but a lot of times the community will receive multiple complaints, and those are the ones that they tend to take a look at. So we talked about the general, we talked about the standards, and the access, access board being required to come up with minimums. So in the public right-of-way, They've been working on coming up with the minimum design criteria for about 20 years. And it's not finished yet. So there's a question of what regulations apply. So the ADA requires you to make your facilities accessible. But do you use the building standards, which are specifically designed for with buildings and sites in mind? Can you use guidelines that have not been finalized and approved? It's kind of hard to figure out what, what to do sometimes. Slide 20. So the overall regulation is that it, for program access is that you cannot discriminate against people who have disabilities for in any state or local government um, activity or service or facility. So what are you supposed to do? How are you supposed to design them so that we can ensure people who have disabilities can use them. So one choice would be to use the proposed accessibility guidelines for um, access to the public right-of-way. And those have been developed. They've evolved over a very long time, but they haven't been, the final text has not been published by the Access Board, so it has not gone on to become an actual standard. You could also choose to use the 2010 ADA standards. 
They're meant for building sites, and so they don't really fit the environment that you find in the public right-of-way. Or if you're a professional um, architect or an engineer where you're, you're tasked with making design decisions every day and you stamp and take responsibility for those, you can just wing it. Slide 21. So how do we decide what to do? And where do we look for that guidance? And several years ago now, I can't remember the year exactly, the Department of Justice and the Department of Transportation came up with a technical memo for resurfacing. And in that technical memo, they didn't make any new rules. They just clarified the intent of the rules that were already in existence. One of the things that is really important in that, and we're not really talking about curb ramps or resurfacing right, right now, but one of the important things is that curb ramps have to follow the 2010 ADA standards. So that's something that a lot of people don't understand, is that you can use the public right-of-way guidelines for areas that are not specifically covered in the building standards. And there was a memo in 2005 from Federal Highway that, that pretty much recognized them as best practices. Um, Federal Highway has not updated that memo, and you're going to possibly get some confusing messages in the near future. And I've talked to the Access Board and Federal Highway. They are not going to be coming out saying that public right-of-way guidelines are best practice. Feel free to use them. The reason for that is they will someday, hopefully in the near future, um, put those out for public comment. And when they go out for public comment, you know, you, it's hard to say, we want your comments, you know, so we can make changes if we need to. It's hard to say that when you've already said, well, these are best practices and that's what we're going to do. So there's flexibility in design. And Federal Highway gives you the flexibility to use whatever information you have available to you to make your pedestrian facilities accessible. So that could be um, the proposed public right-of-way guidelines. It could be the AASHTO guidelines for pedestrian facilities. Um, AASHTO also provides guidance on, um, in their bike book on shared use paths. And AASHTO is the American Association of State Highway Transportation Organizations. Uh, there are also other books out there. Um, NACTO, the National Association of City and, and Towns, um, also pr discusses pedestrian facilities. So you have flexibility. You don't have to use the public right-of-way guidelines. Keep in mind, though, that they have evolved from the access board over time. So we're going to... We're going to talk about them mainly, but I'm going to point out to you areas where there's a difference in the standards. So most of you are familiar with the public right-of-way guidelines, and everybody wants to know what the update is um, and when it's going to be published so it can become a standard. So the final rule that will be published was oh, on slide 22. The final rule draft has been approved by the Access Board. Um, it still has to be reviewed by the Office of Management and Budget. So when anybody makes a federal rule that will go out to the entire country, you have to determine what financial impact it will have on, on the communities that are impacted by it. And that is a process that is, is still being undertaken by the Access Board. Um, once it's reviewed to make sure all the procedures were followed, that it doesn't have doesn't have a financial impact greater than the limit that is set, then it will be passed on by the management of Office of Management and Budget and published in the Federal Register. After that, it's up to the Department of Justice and the Department of Transportation to adopt it before it can become an enforceable standard. So what's going on right now in the federal government is no rulemaking is happening. So the public right-of-way guidelines 
probably will not come out during the current administration. Um, and then it will still take time to, for them to be adopted to be standards. Slide 23. So what can state and local agencies do in the meantime? You have to review your policies. I mean, you have to provide accessible facilities. So if you can review your policies, make sure that what you're, how you're serving your population reflects accessibility so people can get into your buildings, they can use your sidewalks, that you have accessible signals where you need them. Um, review the policies on how those things come into being. Also review your standards. Take a look at your standard drawings, standard details. Do they reflect accessible design? And something else to consider is we all know that those, those design standards don't fit in a lot of places. So have policies set up so that you know what to do when the standards don't fit. How do you make decisions? Um, look at those and, you know, and make sure that the answers reflect a desire to have everyone get around your system. Also provide education. So like we're doing today, find out what your options are. Talk about what's going on. Know what you're obligated to do and how that impacts the work that you're doing. And enforcement at a local level. So the, the ADA requires you to make your facilities accessible, but you can't enforce a federal law at a local level. What you can enforce are your local laws. So if you have policies that say, you know, and standards, um, when you bid a project out for a contractor, you expect them to follow the standards that they bid on. And your, your inspection also has to, has to be up to par so that your finished product is actually accessible. So you can't enforce the ADA, but you can enforce your local policies and make sure that your construction is accessible. Okay, obligations for access on slide 24. So the Americans with Disabilities Act and all of the standards and guidelines have these three requirements. New construction has to be accessible. So when you have the 2010 ADA standards or when public right-of-way becomes a standard, when you build new construction, the expectation is that it's accessible. If you have an alteration to an existing facility, then it has to be accessible to the maximum extent feasible or practicable within the scope of the project. Existing facilities, even if you haven't altered them in the last 50 years, still cannot deny access to persons with disabilities. Slide 25. So we're going to talk about each one of these a little bit. New construction. New construction may be different than the way you think about it. Um, accessibility is the easiest to achieve in new construction because new construction is when you don't have any constraints. So if you look at the picture on the left, it's a picture of a new development. They platted out lots and did their road design. It's the best opportunity you have to move dirt, make grades the way you want them, you know, establish a right-of-way that's wide enough to do what you need to do. So new construction is expected to be accessible. Now, it's pretty narrowly defined. So if you look at the picture on the bottom right, you see a goat path next to a highway going past a bus stop. If you were to put a sidewalk in there, it would not be new construction it would be an alteration, which we're going to talk about. And it's not new construction because you already have an established right-of-way. So slide 26. So a project is an alteration if you're working within an established right-of-way. So like the picture with the bus stop, you're not altering a sidewalk that isn't there you're altering the right-of-way to add a sidewalk. And when you have existing constraints, it's not always possible to meet all of the accessibility requirements. So in an alteration, 
you have to follow the new construction requirements to the extent practicable within the scope of your project. So there are two parts to that. The extent practicable or feasible means if you can't make it fully accessible, you make it accessible the best you can. And so if you can't make your, your sidewalk the same grade as the road because you have to go behind a culvert, then you make it as flat as you can. Within the scope of the project is if you are doing, um, say, a sidewalk project and you get to the corner, do you have to replace a, a pedestrian signal? Not if it's not in the scope of your project. So engineers have project limits. They may be geographical. They may be based on the type of work being done. But you don't have to go beyond those scopes. One of the things that where that comes up frequently is people will ask, do I have to put a, set, a curb ramp on the receiving end of a crosswalk if I fix, if I fix the near side curb ramp? Um, and the answer to that is not if it's not in the scope of your project. But when you, when you're making, uh, project decisions, it's important to document what they are. And this comes up most when you're looking at making something accessible to the maximum extent practical. Um, it's important to document the existing conditions, what you considered, and why you made the final choice. So if you could make a curb ramp longer and a little bit flatter or steeper and shorter, why did you choose to do one or the other? Why did you think that was provided the best benefit for accessibility? Slide 27. And existing facilities. So our communities are full of, of sidewalks and pedestrian access routes that haven't been changed in 50 years. And even those, if you haven't done any alterations to them, can't deny access to people who have disabilities. And the ADA requires Title II agencies, which are state and local governments, to pr have a self-evaluation. And if you have more than 50 employees, to also have a transition plan. And when you do a self-evaluation, you have to look at all of the elements that may need um, structural modifications to make them accessible. Uh, there's some real simple requirements, and that's that you get input from interested parties, and that helps you prioritize what you're going to fix first. Um, specify the steps for achieving accessibility. How are you going to do this? Are you going to do sidewalks when you do resurfacing? Are you going to have a, an annual sidewalk project? Are you going to go through and fix trip and falls this year and next year? Um, something else. So you need to specify those steps, which a lot of times also includes a budget and a schedule. You have to make sure that the plan is available to the public. And with the web these days, that's a pretty simple thing to do. And there has to be a, a person who is responsible for making sure the progress is made. Okay, slide 28. Okay, so now we're going to talk about scoping and technical requirements. Slide 29. So there are a lot of different kinds of pedestrian access routes and pedestrian facilities. Sidewalks are, are the most common. We're all familiar with sidewalks. Shared use paths can be shared between pedestrians and bicycles, uh, rollerbladers, um, you know, any, anybody. There are some places where Certain mobility devices are not allowed on shared use paths, and state laws uh, have to sometimes be looked at when you're building shared use paths in some areas. Um, the shoulder of a road can be a pedestrian access route. Now, as an engineer, and I used to work for a state DOT, uh, shoulder of a road is the shoulder of a road. We build it to support the pavement that cars drive on. However, if you have an area that's marked for pedestrian use, or you have an area where you know pedestrians will be using it on a regular basis just because of the origins and destinations in the area, you need to consider meeting the accessibility requirements. Slide 30. So when you're looking at the different types of pedestrian access routes, um, you might have 
regular sidewalk, shared use path, or a trail. And a pedestrian access route includes pedestrians only, and it serves the purpose of transportation and recreation. A shared use path is also for pedestrians, but it includes bicycles. And designs for pedestrian use paths are based on, based on bikes, mostly because of the high speed use, just like for a road, you have vertical curves and horizontal curves, but they still have to be accessible. And they're used for transportation and recreation. Trails are a whole different animal. So trails are meant for pedestrians, primarily for recreation. And trails are in lesser developed areas. They typically aren't paved. And just because you call something a trail doesn't mean you can use the trail standards. So there's another set of guidelines, the Outdoor Recreational Guidelines, that provide trail standards or guidance. Um, if you're in doubt on what you're building or what, what guidelines to use, you can contact the Access Board and they will help you, help you determine if you really are building a trail. So just because you call it Anderson Trail and it's a paved shared use path doesn't mean you can use the trail guidelines. Next slide. So here's our bus stop again. Do you have to provide sidewalks? And the answer to that is no, not from a federal standpoint. If you provide sidewalks, though, they have to be accessible and usable to people who have disabilities. So you don't have to provide a sidewalk, but if you do, everyone needs to be able to use it. And providing a sidewalk generally falls under a local jurisdiction in their development plans. Um, so you may be required by your, by your community or your state to provide a sidewalk when you put in a new development, but it's not a federal law. Next slide. And I just wanted to share a little story. This is a gentleman that I met in the park when I was with my grandchildren. And him and his family had come into the park, and there was a whole bunch of them and they had boxes and bags and they were obviously going to have a picnic and this young man gets around on a tricycle um, and when I talked to his mom he she said that up until like a month before he wasn't able to get to the park and he wasn't able to get there with his family because there weren't sidewalks that he could travel on safely and there weren't any curb ramps so when we think about whether or not to provide a sidewalk we need to think about the additional benefits, aside from just pedestrians being able to get around. It provides independence and inclusion for people who might not otherwise be able to leave their own, leave their own block. These guys ended up having a, a great Nerf gun fight. It was fun to watch. Next slide. So an important part about pedestrian access route are that they're continuous. So you have to be able to, to provide an accessible route through the whole length of your circulation path. And you can see that in the top left-hand picture, there is a pedestrian-oriented sign, but a person who's using a wheelchair can't get there. So you need a continuous route to link up all of your el continuous or your accessible elements. Um, the bottom left hand side, even temporary structures, people don't think about when they put signs or even work zone cones in the middle of the sidewalk that they've disrupted a route that people need to get through. It needs to be continuous. And in the middle picture, there's a crosswalk with a curb. Obviously, that that pedestrian access route ends at the curb and does not provide access or a safe place for traffic to wait from traffic at the curb. On the right is a picture that's pretty common in my neighborhood. In fact, that is my neighborhood. Um, trash cans on the on the street, and I noticed them as I was driving today. You know, there's trash cans on the street, and people can't get people can't get down and around. 
I can step off the curb and walk in the street. Uh, somebody who uses a wheelchair would have difficulty getting into the street and may not be may not be as safe. So that's something that you can affect with policy. Think about how you're going to address situations like that. Next slide. So we're on slide 34. And we're going to talk about the minimum accessible criteria for pedestrian access routes. Um, clear width, grade and cross slope, surface characteristics, protruding objects, and clear spaces. These are all very simple concepts. They're just really hard to apply. So slide 35. Clear width, like we said, has to be continuous. The minimum clear width for a pedestrian access route is four feet. And that's the minimum. But if it's less than five, you have to have a five by five passing space. So if you were using the building standards in the public right-of-way, the minimum width would only be 36 inches. So that's one of the benefits of using the public right-of-way guidelines is that you have that extra width. And people, people move faster in, when they're in an exterior environment than when they're in a building environment. Um, you in, end up carrying packages. You may have a person using a wheelchair who also has a service dog. So that extra width is really important. When you're building a, sh a shared use path, the entire width has to be accessible and meet the accessibility requirements. So the access board did not design or did not decide on minimum design criteria for a shared use path. That's generally given by um, Federal Highway and AASHTO. And typically it's 10 feet. There are some situations where you can go down to 8 feet. A lot of places, if you have a high volume of people, you need to have 14 feet or more. But no matter how wide it is, from edge to edge, it has to meet the accessibility requirements. Slide 36. And you have to have the continuous clear width. So if you have an obstruction in your sidewalk area, you have to go around it and provide that same four foot width. In the building guidelines, you're allowed to reduce your width to 32 inches to get around an obstruction. Um, the public right-of-way guidelines, that's not the case. And the reason for that, again, is people are moving faster. They may be carrying packages. Um, and there's a fear that if, if there is an allowance for 32 inches, that people will automatically go to that dimension rather than making their sidewalks 40 inches or 38 inches or 46 inches. So they're required to be 48. If it's technically infeasible, then you have to make them as wide as possible. Uh, next slide. Oh, let's go back to go back to slide 36. So one of the places where this comes up is driveways. So when you're trying to cross a driveway, Sometimes it can be beneficial to um, reduce the width of the sidewalk so that you don't have to make the approach to the driveway as steep. So that's one of the times where it may be technically infeasible because you may have to buy excessive right-of-way and do things that are outside the scope of your project. That's where it's important to make sure that you get as much width as you can. And when we talk about getting as much width as you can, if you are down to less than 32 inches, people probably are not going to be able to use it. So you might as well just end your sidewalk. So it's really important to get the full width when you can. Driveways is a place where sometimes you have to compromise, um, but do the best you can. Slide 37. And slopes. Slopes are what get people in the most trouble with compliance. And we talk about slopes. Slope is just rise over run. If you go back to your basic geometry, um, cross slope is the slope that goes side to side. So if you look at the picture on the left, the cross slope is not allowed to exceed 2% on a, on a pedestrian access route. Um, and that is one foot of rise 
for every 50 foot of distance. And the reason cross slope is important, if the world were flat, it would be a lot easier for people who use wheelchairs. Um, but when we're outside on a sidewalk or a trail, then it's important that we also get drainage so that we can get the water off the sidewalk and we don't have puddles. So 2% is the maximum. When we look at running slope, that's the slope in the direction you're traveling. Are you going uphill or are you going downhill? Public right-of-way guidelines allow you to make the grade of your sidewalk the same grade as your street if you're constrained by the street. Um, if you have a pedestrian access route that is not constrained by the street, then your, your grade can only be 5%, which is one foot of rise and 20 feet of run. And sometimes there are constraints. And when you run across constraints, and those could be terrain, they could be environmental or legal um, constraints, then you have to make it you have to make your pedestrian access route accessible to the maximum extent practicable again. And slide 38. Cross slope, like I said, cross slope is important. Um, flat's better if you have to use a wheelchair, but we need 2% or we need some cross slope for drainage. And something that you probably will never see in a standard, and it's kind of a, a part of the art of pouring concrete, is that as your running slope increases, your cross slope can be minimized. So if you look at the picture on the right, how much cross slope do you think, do you, think you need to have water run down that hill? You don't really need any. And same with the curb ramp, when we talk about curb ramps next time. How much, how much cross slope do you need to make water run down a ramp? You don't need any. And so it's a matter of training your contractors, um, training your designers to, to um, minimize slope wherever they can. And um, slide 39. Again, when, when you have running slope and grade, you want to make it as flat as possible. You can make it the same grade as the street. Uh, you've got to get people on the sidewalk have to get to the top of the hill at the, at the same elevation as the people in the road. So that makes sense. But when you're not constrained by the street grade, 5% maximum. And a best practice for running, gr running grade or running slope or grade is that as your grade gets steeper, it's helpful to make your path wider. And I have several friends who use wheelchairs, and a lot of times when we're going downhill, I just get out of the way. Um, they slalom down the hill because it allows them to reduce speed. And uh, so that extra width can be really, really helpful. Now, if you had to use the building standards, the 2010 ADA standards, your grade would be limited to 5% or you would have to use the ramp requirements up to 8%. And there are a lot of places in the country where the road is much steeper than 8% even. Um, slide number 40. So here's an example when the pedestrian access route is not constrained by the street. If you have an independent pedestrian bridge, then the maximum running slope is 5%. And you're still going to have a little bit of cross slope for drainage, but there's no reason to have a full 2%. And sometimes you'll have regulatory constraints that make this difficult to meet because you have to have a, a clearance for trucks or something under the bridge. Now, if your sidewalk just goes beside a road on a bridge, um, then you're still constrained by that road. And slide 41. So compound slopes are when you have running slope and cross slope in the same space. And these are really difficult and dangerous for people to maneuver. Uh, as you're, if you think about a wheelchair or the legs of a walker, they're pretty rigid. So if you think of grandma and her walker coming down the sidewalk, 
and she comes to a compound slope, like the one in the picture, one leg of the walker is going to come down the slope before the other leg. And that's a very dangerous situation, creates a lot of instability. And you can see the little guy in the picture is concerned about sliding out into the road. It also takes, it takes a lot of effort to maintain your balance in that, in that type of situation. And it really does become dangerous. So you end up with those situations in driveways if your sidewalk is not wide enough. Um, you end up in that situation a lot of times if you have old curb ramps that don't have landings. And they should be parallel curb ramps, but they're just kind of slapped into the middle of the sidewalk. Um, but it is really difficult and dangerous for people. Slide 42. So what about construction tolerance? Construction tolerance comes up pretty often. Um, the, both the building standards and the right-of-way guidelines have the exact same guidance on this. You're allowed for, to have industry tolerance except where the dimensions are stated as the range. So if you're told something has to be exactly 36 inches high, then you're allowed to have construction tolerance. But if you have a 36 inch high maximum, then that's a range because you can put it anywhere below 36 inches. So when we look at slope, slopes are actually ranges. So if you have a 5% maximum slope, um, your range really is 0 to 5% or minus 5 to plus 5. So there is no industry tolerance. Can you round your numbers? Rounding, rounding is allowed in the public right-of-way guidelines for dimensions that are based on ratios. The problem with that is Department of Justice and Department of Transportation don't necessarily agree with that. If you try to round, um, you are risking being told that you can't do it. So. Don't try to rely on rounding. So if you have if you have 2.4 on your digital level for a cross slope, and your maximum is 2%, you're you should probably consider it out of compliance. And methods of measure. So how are we supposed to measure all of this? Everybody does it different. Somebody somebody might have a two foot level. Somebody might have a four foot level. I've seen a lot of disputes where they get out the survey transits. To, do, to take measurements. There is no federal guidance on how you're supposed to measure. Um, techniques have changed. These were written in the time of bubble levels and, and steel tapes or even wooden, wooden measuring sticks. Um, so the important part is that when you have a project, um, that you talk to your contractors, you talk to your inspectors, and everybody's on the same page. So a four-foot level is more forgiving than a two-foot level. A two-foot level will pick up changes in slope that the four-foot level may bridge. Um, so there's not, nothing that says what you have to do, but if your contractor is using a four-foot level and your inspector is using a two-foot level, they're going to have some disagreements. So just everybody being on the same page is the important part to that. And I don't know any professionals that have to fly around the country that are carrying four-foot levels. So DOT, DOJ, inspectors, me, you know, we carry two-foot levels. And they are, they are a little more restrictive than a four-foot level. So just a, just a thought. So what do you do about construction tolerance? You really have to account for it in design. So best practice is that you reduce your design standards to account for the tolerance that you expect to see in the field. So 2%, 2.0 is the maximum for cross slope. So if your design standards have 1.5%, that gives you a little bit of room for the contractors, finishers, um, to be a little bit off without actually having to tell them to tear out the sidewalk. And the same thing with running slope. If you specify a running slope, 
a 5%, um, you know, dropping down half a percent and designing for that will make it more likely that your, your construction will be accessible when the concrete dries. And again, clear width. Some inspectors will, are so picky that they will go from the edge of a bevel to the edge of the next bevel and not count that little bit of concrete in that half inch rounded bevel on the sides, which will put you short of your 48 inches if that's, if that's all you design to. So, you know, best practice is going to be that you account for the construction variance in your design. And if you expect the contractors to do this in the field, um, you're doing them a real disservice. Because if your design only gives them a certain amount of space to work, but they have to flatten the slopes to allow for tolerance, things may not fit right. So everybody has to work together to make this, to make this work. Next slide. The surface requirements for pedestrian access routes seem to be kind of vague. Firm, stable, and slip resistant. Um, we don't have any, any measurable guidance for that. Uh, there, is, there are some devices that are under development for firm. And stable just means it stays in place, slip resistant. If it gets wet outside, you shouldn't be, it shouldn't be slippery to walk on. Um, no large openings or gaps. And minimum, minimal vertical discontinuities. Slide 44. So surface requirements. Like I said, firm, staple, and slip resistant. We don't really have, we don't really have measures for those. But concrete and asphalt pavement generally fit that description. You can use brick or paver surfaces if they're flush. Um, wire cut brick, which means it has, each brick has a 90 degree corner on it all the way around and they fit flush up against each other, actually have a better rollability than concrete or asphalt. Um, unfortunately, they're very hard to maintain. So they take a lot to install correctly and even when they're installed correctly, um, they can they get out of place over time. Um, what about grass? Is grass ever ever accessible? And the answer to that is no. So if your bus stops sitting out behind the curb and the only way to get there is walking in the grass, um, that's not firm, stable, and slip resistant. It may feel that way today, but tomorrow when it rains, it won't be. And Wheelchairs that have people in them can weigh six to eight hundred pounds sometimes. Those are the load limits on the bus ramp. So a wet, muddy goat path is not an accessible route. Crushed rock can sometimes work if it's installed correctly and maintained. So if you wet your crushed rock, um, roll it in with a steel wheel roller, wet it again, roll some more. Um, it can work, but it's difficult to maintain. And loose mulch is never accessible. So if you have a if you have a loaded baby stroller, or if you think about a heavy grocery cart trying to push through pea gravel or or mulch, um, you're going to sink. And you know something that has a loose surface is really difficult for a person in a wheelchair to use. And there is a there is a surface research report on the Access Board web page. So if you're building a shared use path or pedestrian path in a less developed area and you're wanting a more natural surface, you might look towards the Access Board's research page to get some more information. Next page. Another surface requirement is no large openings or gaps. So one half inch in the direction of travel is the maximum. And the reason for that, you can see on the page on the right, wheelchair casters are sometimes very small and very hard. And they're narrow and small. They can slip down into the cracks of a drainage grate. And it's difficult to get out. Um, you know, people can be trapped there. So it's important. And if you have utility grates, like on the left-hand side, you may you may put them in the right position when you do 
do construction, but when the guys go in and flush out storm sewers, they're not going to think about it when they put those lids back on. So there are pedestrian friendly grates available. Look into those. Um, you also have to watch with expansion joints on sidewalks. A lot of times they can be filled. Uh, tree grates can sometimes be a problem. So it's a maximum half inch in the direction of travel. Next slide. Slide 46. Another surface requirement is to minimize the vertical discontinuities. So if you have a bump in the sidewalk, it can have a vertical face to it if it's less than a quarter of an inch. Um, it can be up to a half an inch if it's beveled at two to one. And you can combine that vertical and beveled area if the top is beveled. Uh, but you can only do that up to one half of an inch, kind of like a like a threshold when you combine them. Um, anything more than that has to be built to other standards. So 5% or the same grade as your road or 8% for a ramp. And anytime you have a change in slope, we call that a grade break. So if you have one grade of 2% and then the next panel is 5%, where those two different slopes meet, is considered the grade break, and it has to be flush. So you have to be able to go from surface to surface without any vertical discontinuity. Next slide. So slide 47, we just said that um, gaps can only be a maximum of one half of an inch. and. There's an exception to that for the flangeway, gap at rail, flangeway gaps at railroads. And where your sidewalk crosses a railroad, if it's the track serves for light rail only, then the maximum gap that a person has to cross is two and a half inches. Uh, if that track is shared with freight, or it's a freight train track, then the maximum gap is three inches. So that's a whole lot more than half an inch. Um, there are gap fillers that are available. They are difficult to find, um, but I believe that they're used widely in Europe. And I believe some cities are beginning to use them in their light rail areas. So whenever a person using a wheelchair has to cross one of these flangeway gaps, there's a chance that the caster could turn sideways and slip down into that gap. Three inches gives plenty of room for that to happen. Um, so that's something that's it's really important to try to mitigate the, that the best you can. Slide number 48. OK, so now we're going to talk about circulation path. And circulation path is different than a pedestrian access route. The circulation path is anywhere a person can walk. So if I have a sidewalk that is 15 feet wide from the face of a building to the back of a curb, only four foot of that has to meet the pedestrian access route requirements for width, slope, and the surface discontinuities. Um, and it has to, the pedestrian access route within the circulation path has to be continuous. So circulation path, again, is anywhere a person can walk. And where this becomes important is when we talk about protruding objects. And the protruding object requirement applies to the full width of the circulation path, not just the four-foot accessible pedestrian route. Um, there's a four-inch limit to the protrusions. And that applies between 27 and 80 inches above the surface. And we're going to talk about that in a little more in a minute. Next slide, 49. Ramps. So we have requirements for ramps. Um, the requirements in the public right-of-way guidelines and the requirements in the 2010 standards are exactly the same. The slope maximum is 1 in 12, or 8%. You have a cross slope maximum of 2%. But again, how much, how much cross slope do you need for water to run down this ramp? 
You don't really need any. Clear width is 36 inches. So that doesn't change even if the ramp is in the public right of way guide or in the public right of way. So if you have to have a ramp from the sidewalk up to the door of a of a business, um, you could do it at 36 inches and not take up as much sidewalk area. The rise is a maximum of 30 inches, and then you have to have level landings at the top and bottom. Continuous handrails, and you have to have edge protection so a person's wheels don't roll off the side. Slide 50. So the requirements for handrails are the same as the sta ADA standards also. You have to put them on ramps, stairs, and walkways where they're required. Um, knuckle clearance is it's important so that you can reach all the way around the handrail. And there's maximum diameter, minimum maximum. So this is one of the ranges, one and a quarter to two inches. And that applies to the outer diameter. And for circular and non-circular cross sections, um, you can have four to, four to six and a quarter inch measured around the cross section. Next slide. Protruding objects. So when we talk about circulation paths, we talk, I mentioned protruding objects. You, you can't have protruding objects anywhere in the circulation path. And a protruding object is anything that sticks out more than four inches in the range of 27 inches high to 80 inches high. So below 27 inches, a person will probably detect it with their cane. So if you look at the picture on the right, that's a pretty good example. They've put a barrier underneath an open stairway, and a person is going to find that with their cane before they run into it with their head. If you have post-mounted objects, and when we're talking about the public right-of-way, that's generally signs, uh, parking signs, you know, pay station signs, work zone signs. Um, they can't protrude more than four inches beyond the base or the pole. So you can put a base, if you have a, a diamond-shaped sign, you can put a base on it that goes out to within four inches if it sticks out you know, between 27 and 80 inches. And if you have a sign that's mounted on two posts and they're spaced more than 12 inches apart, you need to put a detectable, a detectable element below 27 inches so that a person doesn't try to walk between them. Next slide. Slide 52 just gives some examples of protruding objects. Some of these, again, are from my neighborhood. Um, a lot of times you see communities put up banners. And you've got to make sure that those banners are more than 80 inches high. Vehicle direction signs. The sign in the top middle is one near a coffee shop. And people walk past that all the time. And it's about shoulder height. So a person who is, is blind or visually impaired may not see that, and then they would run into it. Obviously, that's a problem. Um, push buttons, that this is not a compliant push button, um, but it's a, an example of where you can find a protruding object where you might not really think about it. Down in the bottom in the center is a memorial cannon at a historical site. and. It, the base of it protects most of the cannon, but there needs to be a detectable curb or something the full length of the cannon, or at least to within four inches, so people don't walk from the side and run straight into it. Um, you also notice on that picture in the bottom center that there's a light post with all kinds of signs on it on the other sidewalk. That other sidewalk is about 36 inches. And it might as well not be there, because if you come come up that curb ramp onto that sidewalk, you're not going any further. So here's the last picture on the right in the bottom uh, is a really common problem, and that's vegetation. You know, and nobody wants to walk into um, wet tree limbs if you can't see them coming. And so this is one of the things that you need to look out for in maintenance. And it's an ongoing maintenance. You can't just trim them on once and be done. 
slide number 53. So temporary routes also have to be accessible. So if you have a temporary pedestrian access route for a street fair or maybe a farmer's market in the park, that has to be accessible. Um, even though it's temporary. And you can find mats that will provide a firm, staple surface. And you can make sure that, that vendors and such are, are located in a place where it's easy to get to and on a flatter surface. Um, for engineers, what we look at for temporary routes a lot of times is a work zone. So when we have to close a sidewalk for construction, um, we need to provide an, an alternate route. And the right-of-way guidelines, um, 2010 standards, they don't, they don't address how to do a work zone. So the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, which is a federal highway book, um, chapter 6 covers work zones. And it covers pedestrian routing and signing the proper barriers for protection and what criteria are required, um, and discusses channelizers for guidance and wayfinding. So nobody reinvented the wheel. Uh, we're counting on the MUTCD to make sure that, that people make their work zones accessible. And there is an allowance for a temporary lack of access for maintenance. So just like if an elevator went down in a building, there's not much you can do about it except wait until it's fixed. Um, the expectation, though, is that you maintain your accessible features and that they're fixed as quickly as possible. Um, slide 54. And here are some work zone examples. So you can see on the top left that there's a sidewalk close sign and a detour sign. Now, for a person who is blind, they're going to detect that, but they obviously are not going to be able to read the signs. There are some other options out there that are proximity controlled. So just like a motion sensor, when someone gets to that point, it will audibly say sidewalk is closed in 200 feet or cross here, sidewalk closed ahead. Um, so there are a lot of other options out there. The picture shows some of the devices that are used. Uh, the diagram in the center at the top is right out of the MUTCD, so it gives you some template setups. And there are a lot of other work zone guidance books out there. Uh, ATSA, which I will never remember what ATSA stands for, um, ATSSA has great work zone guidance documents also. The top left. So for one thing that I didn't, I didn't put up here is cones and yellow tape. We see that all the time, especially in a really short-term work zone. Those are absolutely not effective. The one on the top right is a little bit risky from a contractor standpoint. They've provided, they've provided a surface that people can use. Um, for a person who's visually impaired, they may have difficulty finding their way knowing for sure that they're where they're supposed to be and not in the middle of a construction site. But mostly that's a risk for a contractor. And it's certainly not something you would put in your policies. And the bottom bottom right is a, something I came across out walking last summer. No warning, nothing. Um, just a big pile of big pile of dirt and construction barrels and equipment left in the middle of the road overnight. So here's some some good things. The barriers on the bottom are are meet the requirements. You can find them. They're not that difficult to purchase and store. Um, and then there's bad examples too. Next slide. And maintenance. So the ADA regulations require maintenance of accessible features. So if you build a sidewalk, you're going to maintain it forever. Um, and that's the responsibility of having pedestrian facilities. You're allowed to have temporary lack of access. So if you have, if you have a sidewalk panel that's out because you're putting utility, utilities in, 
um, you have to determine how long is too long. And there isn't much guidance on that. Um, if it's long enough to get a complaint, it's too long. Um, best practices, you know, you, you need to make sure that you have policies, <coughs> policies that reflect good access and keep your maintenance up to date. So in the spring and in the fall, do you have a policy to go through and trim brush? You know, do you have the equipment and staff that you need to do that? The bottom picture, you can see the creek has come up during a big storm event. People are still using the shared use path that runs under this bridge. And they're using it because they don't have a choice. That's how they get where they need to go. And, you know, that needs to be cleaned up. It's a temporary lack of access because it's certainly not firm, stable, or slip resistant. But it needs to be cleaned up quickly. And there needs to be a policy that says, you know, and after a certain storm event, we'll check these paths and clear them off and have equipment and staff to make sure that it happens. And the same happens for snow removal. I mean, people in the northern part of the country, you have snow, it comes every year. Um, what are you going to do about it when it blocks your sidewalks and blocks your curb ramps? Those are maintenance requirements that need to be addressed. And Federal Highway has a maintenance guide. If you look up pedestrian maintenance guide on Federal Highway, it's in their safety section. And it has some really good guidance. And again, tree trimming. It's just a necessary thing that has to be done. Slide 56. So here's just some best practices. Uh, if you want to minimize your chance of having a lawsuit, or having the Department of Justice SWAT team come knock on your door, listen to your public and accommodate their requests. If you have somebody that says, hey, there's a big chunk out of the sidewalk and I can't get through here, you need to pay attention because people will ask nicely for, for quite a while, but eventually they're going to find DOJ's website and it's really easy to, to file a complaint. So be kind, be considerate, and try to accommodate requests or help help to mitigate whatever problem a person might be having. Um, just in general, maximize clear width so people can get around. Minimize slopes. Flatters better. Consider the impact of compound slopes and avoid them. Um, make sure that your design standards take into account the construction tolerance you need for finishing concrete. Standardize a method for inspection. You know, it's a good idea to have a, an inspection checklist. You know, it helps to have a similar design checklist, but that way your inspector knows what they're looking for. Um, you can document it. The contractors know that they, they have met their requirements and, and, you know, they've done what they, what they were supposed to do and now you can pay them and everybody's happy. So inspection is really important. And look, look at your maintenance schedules. Make sure you have routine maintenance checks. And then look for low-hanging fruit. So you may have old sidewalks that have a lot of a lot of heaves in them from trees or just you know se settlement from utility trenches. Those are actually low-hanging fruit. There are ways to grind or cut those, and you can see the picture on the bottom. The sidewalk panels had shifted, and it was going to be a long time before that cross slope was going to be adjusted and corrected, but the cross slope is not as big a problem as the vertical discontinuity. If you talk to your, if you talk to your attorneys, your trip and fall um, settlements are usually pretty high. And even if you're not meeting all the accessibility requirements, when you do a small improvement like this, you're making things better for everyone. Slide 57. So here are some real basic links for resources. Um, the Access Board is your best resource for public right-of-way information and help. Uh, you can go to their website. When you look for the latest version of the public right-of-way guidelines, it's the 2013 Supplemental Notice of the Proposed Public Right-of-Way Accessibility Guidelines, and it's actually in their Shared Use Path section, and it's just called Supplemental. Um, 
you can contact them for assistance and their wet or their their email address should be row at access board.gov so ignore the www um, and you'll get a response generally in writing sometimes you'll get a phone call if, if it's better to have a conversation um, federal highway Ideally, work through your state division office. The Federal Highway Administration has 50 different offices, and you don't always get the same answer from all 50 states. So some of them are, are really on top of accessibility, some of them not so much. But if you can't get the answers you want, um, or if you can't get the right answer, might not be the one that you want, uh, you can always call the Access Board and they can they can provide you some additional guidance on who to contact. And the Department of Justice has a section for Title II Technical Assistance and their website's just ada.gov. You can also see their latest enforcement, which is kind of an interesting, interesting thing to look at. So Slide 58, I think we're done. We're going to turn it over to Nancy for questions. And at this point, we'll go ahead and begin taking questions from the audience. For those of you on the webinar platform, you can submit your questions uh, or comments in the chat feature. You can control, you can press Control M on your keyboard or Command M. Um, or you can email us at adatraining at transcend.org. And at this point, I will turn it over to Nancy uh, to uh, present the questions. Nancy? Thanks, Mater. And thank you, Melissa, for all that great information. Um, we do have a few questions that we've had submitted ahead of time, and so we'll start out with those. In the meantime, Mater, I'm not sure if you can restore my moderator status in the webinar platform so that I can see any questions coming in to the chat feature. Um, but we will start with a couple that we have had submitted. Um, Melissa, could you talk a little bit more about the issues about temporary pedestrian routes around work zones? Um, if, the, um, if the existing facilities, the original facility is not accessible, does, should there be any concern about the accessibility of the temporary route? So that's a really good question. Um, I hear that a lot. The MUTCD actually says that the alternate route has to be as accessible as the existing facility. But best practice would be to make the temporary route or the alternate route fully accessible if possible. So if a person has to go from the sidewalk into the street, it's obviously there wasn't a curb ramp there before. And even if there was a curb ramp at the corner that wasn't accessible, putting in a temporary curb ramp that meets the requirements is the right thing to do. So MUTCD says it has to meet the existing, that has to be as accessible as the existing facility. but if you can, that's a minimum. So if you can do better, um, you probably should do that. And most most Thank people make you. their have a policy that they're fully accessible. Excellent. Well, that's always the smart move, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we have another question. Um, someone was, is hoping that you could speak a little bit more to railroad crossing issues as far as who is really responsible for that, or does, is it collaboration that needs to happen when you have to have pedestrians crossing uh, railroad tracks? Well, and that's and that's a good point, Nancy. It is collaboration, but who, the railroads are notoriously difficult to work with. Uh, but if you build a sidewalk across railroad property, if you're a city or a county or a state, you're responsible for making sure that that railroad crossing is maintained to be accessible. And um, schedule, scheduling that out, you have, to, you have to plan to work with the railroads for 
quite a ways in advance. And it does take collaboration for it to happen. And they may have specific material requirements and may prefer to take part in some of the construction. Thank you. Um, we actually have a couple of questions that I think are sort of along the same lines that are really looking to understand the difference between um, uh, new construction and alterations and, and maintenance. Um, for example, if you have to replace a whole length of sidewalk because it's just become so cracked and heaved or it's been maybe destroyed in a disaster, is that going to be considered uh, new construction, an alteration, or maintenance? So any time that an alteration is defined as something that changes the usability of a facility. So if you're taking out something that's damaged or that's too narrow, um, you're actually changing the usability of that facility. And it's considered an alteration. So even if you're replacing it in kind, you need to make the alteration accessible to the maximum extent practicable. Thank you. That helps. That helps a lot. Um, we have another question about uh, cross slope. Could you maybe little, uh, explain a little bit more about why uh, cross slope greater than 2% is problematic on a, a level uh, walking surface? So cross slope, uh, as a person, who's using a wheelchair is going down the sidewalk. If you have excessive cross slope, it takes a lot of effort to maintain a straight direction. So a person has to, if you think about going, going across a downhill, crossing the street that's going downhill, you, you have to have a lot more effort uh, pushing one wheel to keep yourself from turning and going down the hill. And when you think about it in that extreme example, I mean, that's, that's easier to understand. But if you are constantly fighting to keep from going downhill on your cross slope, it takes a lot of extra effort. And for people who, people who use wheelchairs, especially people who use manual wheelchairs, almost always over time will blow out their shoulders. And um, if you have to go a mile or two to work, or even four or five blocks from the metro to your office building or to school, um, that extra effort may make the difference in the activities that you get to participate in because you're always exhausted. And physically, your body just wears out. So the 2% max is really is a max and it really it really is important to the people who who depend on on us making things accessible. It also if you ever close your eyes and walk down the sidewalk with bad cross slope, uh, it's you tend to go towards the downhill side of that cross slope. So even for a person with balance issues or a vision impairment, uh, it can create some difficulties. Thank you. Um, we have a question about this concept of impracticability. And could you speak to, to that a little bit more at all about what that really uh, means? So when we talk about technical impracticability is the preferred term. Um, impractical and infeasible are basically the same. Um, it means if, if something is going to take extensive effort, and I can't, I can't define that for you, or if it's just absolutely impossible, um, then it's considered technically impractical or practicable or infeasible. So if you have one of the situations where it comes up on sidewalks is if you're building a pedestrian bridge over a railroad, the railroad has a requirement for a clear distance in height. 
So if you don't have enough right away or you're constrained by other environmental issues, um, you may not be able to get a 5% pedestrian path and meet that regulatory requirement by the railroad. So then you would do the best you can and you would make it accessible to the maximum except practicable. Um, you might do other things to mitigate that excessive slope that you can't really completely eliminate, like making the path wide enough so that a person can can go back and forth as they go down the hill. Um, and it gives people more maneuvering room going uphill. So technically impracticable and technically infeasible is rel relative to what you're doing. And if you're using it as an excuse, then you know, you can define it widely, but you'll have, you may have to defend it someday in court. And so if you choose to say something is impracticable, um, you need to feel comfortable that, that other people would see it the same way and agree with you. Well, that's helpful. I think that's really helpful. Some examples and some, some good guidance there. Um, I think that may be all the questions that we had. Um, we do have, I'm not sure if you want to talk about this today, we do have a question about diagonal curb ramps. Um, but I'm not sure you want to speak to that. Would you like to talk a little bit about diagonal curb ramps? So we're going to cover curb ramps in the next webinar, but I know I know I purposely made this a little bit short so we'd have time for, for plenty of questions. Um, we're going to talk about resurfacing and curb ramps next time. And one of the reasons, I guess we're going to talk about diagonal curb ramps, but we can, we can talk about it now too, is a lot of people want to put in diagonal curb ramps because they feel that one curb ramp is less expensive and less problematic than two. And the problem with that is that you need a curb ramp for each street crossing. And there's some good slides for that that will show, um, you know, the disadvantage to a diagonal curb ramp is that it it's directed towards the center of the road. And so a person who has a vision impairment, if they use that diagonal curb ramp, may get to the bottom of the curb ramp and then they've got to the they have to reorient themselves and find the crosswalk and get squared up with the world again. Meanwhile they're standing out there at the apex of the corner and they're much more vulnerable to traffic. So um, it's important to have a, a curb ramp for each street crossing. And another question that might come up, well, we can look at diagonal curb ramps and impracticability too. And sometimes in a really steep terrain, if you have a, two really steep roads that intersect, it may be technically impracticable to meet the slope requirements in your construction. And you might find that a diagonal curb ramp does a better job of serving that purpose than two separate curb ramps. Um, so that would be making something accessible to the maximum extent practicable and having that compromise of, building a diagonal curb ramp because that actually works better based on the terrain than if you had built two curb ramps that were both a lot less compliant. That's a great answer and I think that's a great, uh, a great segue to talk about our next session, a good teaser for our ne next uh, session. And so we have just a few minutes left till the bottom of the hour, so I think maybe we will move on to slide 59 and just do a little bit of wrap up for our session today. Um, the next session, uh, part two, is going to be on uh, intersections, safe and accessible intersections. Melissa will be talking about curb ramps, street crossings and signals. After that, part three is about curbside access. We'll learn a little bit about transit stops, parking, passenger loading zones. And the final part four in our series, ensuring access on public right-of-way projects, we'll talk about some design issues, construction inspection, and best practices. So all things we can look forward to. Um, on slide 60, 
we want to um, share this information with you for those of you who need a certificate of participation or the LUHSW uh, credit for AIA. The word of the day is sidewalk. Sidewalk. So um, please consult the reminder email that you received about this session for instructions on uh, obtaining that certificate of participation uh, for this webinar. Um, for the code, you can uh, please email the code to ADA training at transcend.org by 5 p.m. Eastern on Monday, May 6th this coming Monday. Also, um, keep your eye out for an email about our evaluation. We appreciate it if you would fill out uh, an evaluation, provide us feedback on today's session. We appreciate that feedback. And on our next slide, we have just um, provided our contact information for us here at the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. Project of Transcend, and we'd like to thank you all for joining us today, and we would especially like to thank Melissa Anderson for uh, presenting us all this great information today. Um, it's been a wealth of information. I know I've learned something, and I'm sure everyone else did. Um, please feel free to contact us if you have additional questions, and we will hope to see you all back here for our upcoming sessions in this series. So again, thank you all for joining us, and have a good day.